Chainsaw Man is cinema. And I don't say that in jest. This is a series that manages to have a character that literally has arcs where his sole goal is to touch a... Whoa, hello! While also delivering a complicated and nuanced story about some pretty difficult subject matters. And now that this extremely interesting anime adaptation has caused the popularity of the series to explode, I think it's about time I take a look at this season of the series I love, talk about its production, voice acting, and story to see if it delivers the experience I, as a Chainsaw Man fan, was hoping for. This is going to be a long one, everyone, so sit back, grab some food, and dive into the wacky world of Fujimoto with me as I break down and review what is currently one of the most popular anime on the planet. I'm Totally Not Mark, and this is my review of Chainsaw Man Season 1. Diamond in the name of Devil! Introduction. As I'm sure many of you out there might be aware of already, I've actually written a comprehensive review of the manga for this series on my channel across three separate parts. And while I will be repeating some of my thoughts on the narrative, you can consider this a one-stop shop for my thoughts on both the manga and the anime itself, with plenty of new material I wanted to touch on concerning this anime adaptation, how it's made, where I think its weaknesses are, and how it managed to produce one of the best episodes of anime I've ever seen. Right out the gate, with this anime adaptation, MAPPA makes their presence felt. Belt. I've complemented their application and use of 3D assets and models with the likes of Attack on Titan's final season, and this seems to employ a lot of what made that feel special too, if not in a more subtle fashion. At least in this opening episode anyway. 3D particles floating in the air offering a sense of depth and grounding the scene in reality. This alongside some more subtle animation nods, and you have for yourself a very immersive first episode. And that's not even to mention the absolutely incredible opening theme animation which, as of running this video, currently boasts over 57 7 million views on YouTube. It's a standout smorgasbord of animation, music, character, and color that captures my interpretation of the manga perfectly. The vibrant splashes of color remind me of the manga covers themselves, contrasting jaw-dropping and bombastically animated action sequences with more mundane and light-hearted fare purposefully that capture the Chainsaw Man-ness, for lack of a better term, I was worried I wouldn't see. I mean, that sequence where it zooms in on Power's chest only to further zoom in again into something more absurd with Denji in the background, all pixels it just feels so candid and full of the wackiness this series is known for. And as I'm sure many of you have noticed or seen being discussed online already, the OP of this also features countless nods to classic films such as Reservoir Dogs, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Pulp Fiction, and No Country for Old Men to name but a fraction of the references crammed into this OP. Fitting as the author of Chainsaw Man himself, Fujimoto, is a massive movie buff. But how do I personally determine the quality of a series, you might be asking? Well, Typically, I have a few indicators I look out for. With regards to an intro chapter, or in this case, intro episode, there's a tremendous amount of heavy lifting this section of the story is required to shoulder. What sort of lifting is required? Well, it depends largely on the sort of story you're trying to tell. Take Attack on Titan, for example. AOT is a story whose strengths reside in the dramatic, grotesque, and the mysterious. And due to the attention span of many readers, this opening chapter needed to be capable of communicating those exact qualities, while simultaneously investing us into the main cast themselves. Hajime Isayama achieved this balance through the character of Eren Yeager, a character whose entire being runs counter to the status quo in this world, and so, by getting to know him and his ambitions, we gradually, and most importantly, naturally learn about the broader world of Attack on Titan, its mysteries, and finally, the dramatic threat on the final few pages. And so, keeping that in mind, does Chainsaw Man deliver a captivating opening? Well, let's have a look. Broadly speaking, the story of Chainsaw Man explores the life of our main character, Denji, a down-on-his-luck orphan struggling to pay off his father's debts as a freelance devil hunter. For simplicity's sake, devils are this universe's monsters, and he works in this role alongside his little canine slash chainsaw devil friend, Pochita. The rules of this world are relatively simple, with the only nuance coming by way of something that's called a contract, an agreement made specifically between a devil and human, resulting in the first chapter depicting a fusion of Denji and his little devil dog, Pochita, turning Denji effectively into a hybrid of a human and devil, before being discovered by the mysterious Makima, offering Denji a dilemma. Die here as a devil by her hand, 
or work for her and her government-funded Devil Hunter agency. And that's the basic outline of the first episode, where Attack on Titan was driven by its plot and mystery, Chainsaw Man, at least in these opening chapters or episodes, is driven by its characters. In the same way Aaron Yeager facilitates natural chances to show why his series was interesting, so too does Denji serve his story, only in a much more reactive sense. Where Aaron in Attack on Titan was inclined to drive the plot forward, Denji, by virtue of who he is, sort of goes with the flow while other, much stronger personalities join the fray later on, allowing the series to feel much more like an ensemble cast despite it being specifically about Denji's journey. But that's just the story front. When I look at an anime adaptation, I also look for ways this chosen medium has been used in ways the manga did not have available to bolster the themes and direction of the story at hand. I look for this because it offers a greater utility to the anime itself, making use of the chosen medium all the while enhancing the source material if done correctly. And I think these first episodes show signs of that already. There's a lot of atmospheric ambient lighting that seems to correlate and create contrast in following the through line of the story or at least Denji mood, projecting Denji's fondness from the past in bright colors with the gritty, moody, and grim reality he finds himself in living currently is a strikingly effective contrast, and not something that was at Fujimoto's disposal in the manga, with the message and mission set by Pocheta being to turn his real world and circumstances into the dreams he professed to have. Resulting in one of the most metal and badass transformations I've seen in quite some time, the animated fight scene depicting the birth of Chainsaw Man was a very well orchestrated, if not slightly understated for my taste personally. There's an interesting combination of 2D and 3D effects work on display here that really helped to capture the messy and clumsy nature of this first outing in the transformed state. Although for me and what I was expecting, I don't think it captured the bloodbath intensity of some of the panels from Fujimoto's original work during this section. But of course, this is just a first episode and there's still time. However, what's interesting about this scene to me is less the transformation and more so Makima's introduction to the series. From the moment I saw this girl while reading the manga, she scared me stiff. She's an oddly calm presence in what is quite literally a world filled with monsters. Introduced at the end of the very first episode, literally melting through Denji's more assertive side all the way through to the vulnerable core of his character, she appears comforting and exactly what Denji thinks he wants. However, in reality, she's offering him an ultimatum. One that if he chooses incorrectly could result in his death here and now as a devil. This coupled with the shadows enshrouding her character, the authority she speaks with, and the fearless and disarming demeanor she waltz is up to Denji with makes for a very interesting character to say the least. The likes of which are made to make both us and indeed Denji feel smaller than and subservient to. But that's just the first episode. The first arc within these first couple of episodes are largely centered around introducing us to key recurring characters in the devil hunting agency Denji's joined as well as the duties he has therein. The first of these key characters that I've already touched on is Makima. She seems to be a higher up in this government funded agency tasked to take down devils for society and is on this weird power kick with Denji I will almost definitely touch on later. Emphasis on touch. Next is Aki Hayakawa. Denji's colleague, or should I say, handler. Compared to Denji and a certain other character I'll touch on in just a second, he's quite stoic with a lot more going on right beneath the surface we've not yet seen much of. He also acts as a vehicle for which Denji can reaffirm his convictions to us as an audience. His dynamic with Hayakawa acts as a convenient mechanism for us to learn more about this world as Denji, unaware of the broader details of his new devil powers and indeed the world's rules, can ask all the necessary questions for which Aki can facilitate an answer. In the past, I've praised Fujimoto's paneling and described it as funnier than some of my favorite comedic mangas ever, and that's something I was very concerned about when I saw the anime's initial trailer. While it looked utterly spectacular and a feast for the eyes if ever there was one, while all of that was of course promised, I was less convinced about the comedy which, as I learned upon reading this series, is a core component that makes the experience of Chainsaw Man so special. But I've glossed over Makima and Denji's initial meeting and I want to emphasize that while the manga was brilliant, I thought the anime offered its own flair that enhanced, or at the very least reinforced, the moment substantially on a visual level. The direction is honestly terrific for this scene and both voice actors play up their roles exceptionally well. Denji specifically when he says he cannot feed himself leading to a weirdly well animated sequence where Makima feeds him udon. Similarly and in that vein, I enjoy how visually Makima lifts slash guides Denji away from the shadows of his former life and into the bright and vibrant new world for him and us 
to explore. As pointed out moments prior, Denji's current dream is to exist in the world and have a decent standard of living. And in getting this, the world is depicted in an ethereal, almost dreamlike glow, at least in contrast to where he once was. And this meeting with Makima acts as the core ignition point for this technique to be employed throughout this season. Lifting him out of the gutter, the sun starts to rise as she hugs him and as their day presses on and he realizes what his new life is going to be, the reality of this world around Denji grows brighter and brighter with a nice amount of comedy thrown into boot. However, I think this opening's most important narrative component, at least in terms of pacing, comes in episode 2 following this sudden realization by Denji that he's already achieved his goal. And so he recognizes that his life isn't going to be worth much if he's already achieved his goal of getting off the streets and eating relatively well. He sees people like Hayakawa driven by retribution, Makima driven by Makima. 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 This is, however, where I think I'm going to run into some issues here with this adaptation. Scenes like this, while iconic in the manga, due to the nature of reading, offers a lot of interpretation and subjectivity for each reader. I've seen similar things happen in the past where a famous book might get adapted and fans of the series will have gripes with a lot of surface level choices made because it doesn't map onto how they interpreted a scene or a character, and that can really impact how a person feels about a scene. And I think this is such an instance. For me, I don't think they captured the impact of the innocent, quiet absurdity that was quote i want to touch boobs which honestly is a shame meme anime moments like this aren't impossible to get right as seen with the now famous quote okay moment from one punch man's first season delivered perfectly but with that said it's not a massive deal and i'm more interested in how this adaptation can offer new reasons to love this story for instance the conviction denji delivers his boob speech afterwards was i think better than the manga presented stunningly as the lewd posters in the background act as the goal with which his hand grasps at offering again a nice visual Visual metaphor to play into the strengths of the medium. But yes, this is Denji's new goal, my friends. And this is where a new character called Power comes screaming into the story. <laughs> Power is the perfect yin to Denji's yang, while also sharing so many things in common with him. And her introductory story with the group is on its face utterly silly, with Denji effectively trying to win Power's favor to touch her chest. However, what spawns from this is oddly and surprisingly brilliant. However, before I talk about that, and while I have an entire section dedicated to the production of this anime later, I just have to talk about Tatsuki Fujimoto's character designs because they're absolutely outstanding. When one starts designing a character, one of the most important aspects to keep in mind is how this design will serve to communicate to a reader who this character is just at a glance. Denji as a character is quite unassuming and simple, and his character design reflects that very reality. Hajime Isayama took a very similar approach with Eren Yeager in Attack on Titan by drawing him in a rather unremarkable and almost forgettable fashion. The point of Eren Yeager early on is to point out that he isn't remarkable, and the same is true for Chainsaw Man's Denji in this instance. Furthermore, and again like Eren Yeager, Denji's transformed state is enhanced to look even more impressive simply by comparison to his base form. Think Magikarp and Gyarados. Gyarados looks impressive already, but when you look at Magikarp next to it, suddenly it looks all the more monstrous. And where Eren in Attack on Titan enhances his Titan form's intimidation factor, one could say that Chainsaw Man utilizes and leans into this very visual trick a lot more effectively. Brandishing a meek and shrinking posture, wearing a large amount of white with rounded, almost quivering shapes, and lines used to convey his softer human side. Denji's physical form stands in stark contrast with the violent, jagged, and exaggerated shapes that coat this comic's pages in the blood of its enemies. In every sense of the word, this design is one built on the back of contrasts. Contrasts that communicate a distinct shift in how this character engages with the world around him. Whether it be exaggerated instances like those in which he fully transforms, or even the crooked smiles he shares when something more is on his mind. Denji is a regular, almost forgettable looking person in the world when nothing is driving him or threatening him. However, when something does even a little bit, he starts to reveal a set of sharp and potentially dangerous teeth. Perhaps implying that right beneath this unassuming facade lies the power of a true devil. Furthermore, and quite ingeniously, I very much love how Denji being ill-equipped to put on his own tie for the uniform facilitates not only his depiction as someone that doesn't come from this world, but also provides a nice visual metaphor for a dog collar. The uniform given to him by Makima and the tie wrapped around his neck 
represents a leash, a noose, and a new way of life all at once. Someone like Hayakawa, on the other hand, is almost the exact opposite and seems to be wound quite tight. And I think partly this is what makes his dynamic with Denji so interesting. While Denji's outward appearance is consistently messy, Hayakawa always has his hair tied up purposefully, all the while he wears a much more complete dark uniform. Symbolic of his devotion to the job he has and perhaps hinting towards a darker backstory driving him forwards. And finally, let's talk about power. The character of Power speaks to this philosophy directly. The moment we meet Power, she is over the top, loud, and swinging her fist in the air. A big personality with an appearance that communicates that very aspect of her character through her clothes and devil traits being much more obvious on her than on Denji's character design. Whether it be her disheveled hair, half-tucked in shirt, jagged teeth, horns, or her eyes bearing a striking resemblance to that of a crosshairs on a gun, Power comes across as a boisterous, mischievous, and active character to team up with our less driven and thus far comparatively passive main character in Denji, creating this wonderful kinetic push and pull dynamic, which leads us nicely into the second and really the first major arc of this story, the Bat Devil arc. Episode 3, 4, and part of 5 are where we finally begin to get a handle on the main throughline of the story, and while a shallow level observation of this arc might lead you to believe it's a simple, noble quest a young man undergoes to earn power's favor, it is, in fact, a story about complicated themes of manipulation, trust, and other things. In interviews, Fujimoto, the author of Chainsaw Man's manga, has revealed that a main inspiration behind the character of power came from that of none other than South Park's very own Eric Cartman. And you can absolutely see that in her introductory sequence. She's chaotic, abrasive, and most importantly, active, making her a terrific addition to Denji's already reactive personality, creating moments for him to react to and indeed for us to learn more about the story. Screw you guys, I'm going home. This is what we understand and know about Power. But in episode 3, following Power's introduction and subsequent professional mistake, both her and Denji begin to argue as Makima cuts them both off. Immediately, Power stops shouting and listens. Despite the wording of this being slightly different to what I read in the manga, it is, at least at this point in the story, the only indication that something more is going on with Makima and absolutely put her on my watch list while the rest of this story unfolded. On one hand, she seems to be held in pretty high regard by pretty much everyone, including Aki, who we don't have any reason not to trust at this point. But on the other hand, she treats both Denji and Power as if they were dogs. And in response to this supposed coercion, once Power learns what Denji wants, she leverages that so she can achieve her ends. Power wants her cat back from this devil holding it hostage, and Denji wants the goods. Each individual has something the other can potentially fulfill, and therein lies the motivation and dynamic for this short arc's hijinks. When I read the story of One Piece, I loved it for its depth of lore, character, and at times, profound introspection. It's accuracy when dissecting the human condition through a cavalcade of warm and fiendish characters. With Chainsaw Man, I love it almost as much for what amounts to practically the exact opposite reason in this arc. And I think it's down to how, in a sense, simple Fujimoto has decided to keep his plot lines, at least as we understand them right now. How many points of view or groups are we following in this story? Just one really, Denji and Power patrolling the area and looking for her lost cat. And thanks to this, Fujimoto is never really in a rush to communicate anything to us. If he wants to show two colleagues sitting in a bus with nothing to talk about, he will. If he wants to show an awkward interaction for the sake of a joke, he will more than happily sacrifice many pages, or in this case, seconds or minutes of an anime, to bring that vision to life. And due to this, the result isn't something you need to study feverishly. There's rarely ever a single moment where you're challenged with a massive exposition dump and think, I sure hope I hold on to all of this information. And so Chainsaw Man, because of its approach, makes exceptional use of space, expression, character acting, voice acting, and music, which in turn enhances the humor, drama, and ultimately, the horror element of this story. Helped tremendously by facilitating some great character-defining moments for Denji, where he decides to show his desire to protect people and other moments where he chooses to be more reckless. And while the fight is great, it's the latter part of that which makes this story blossom for me, particularly when it comes to power and Denji's relationship. And not to mention animation. 
if we rewind back a bit, this series has some tremendous animation to speak on, but some of the most understated moments, like two individuals hanging out and exploring each other's minds, all the while being surrounded by a bunch of illuminating vending machines, bathing them in an ambient glow offering a spectacular atmospheric tone. Furthermore, I hope folks notice that while Denji is pursuing his dreams, the world around him is fantastical and dreamlike. However, when he goes farther away from that reality, his world becomes darker again, muted, lifeless, exemplified through power dragging Denji away from his new world. In Denji's mind, he's moving closer to his goal of touching Power's chest, but in reality and visually, it's communicated that he's moving farther away to his conspired death, reflected in the muting of the colors and light as he approaches the Bat Devil's hideout and I just love when shows like this succeed in this sort of way. This is the confrontation where Denji proves to Power that he's someone worthy of further consideration. Unlike Denji, Power is categorized by everyone, including herself, as someone very different to Denji and other humans. Countless times she points out emotional problems she sees with the way Denji and other humans express themselves. This cold way of seeing the world is chalked up to her being a fiend by others and even us until we see her internal feelings concerning her beloved cat. Having lured and ambushed Denji into this bat devil's lair to sacrifice him and rescue her cat, she herself gets double-crossed and in the process, eat. And while Denji finds new reserves of boob-inspired strength, we as an audience dive deep into who she is as a character, and we learn that while she is quite disconnected, she is capable of feeling an appreciation and fondness for something more than her own well-being. Furthermore, having now seen the animation for the Bat Devil vs. Chainsaw Man, I have to say that I thought it felt a lot more frantic and intense in the manga. This isn't to suggest, of course, that there's not something to enjoy here. There's of course some great effects work and composition. The 2D animation sequences are brilliant with a fantastic final blow from Denji. And personally, I enjoyed this fight. Though I think that in this instance, the 3D elements stand out in my mind as the weakest part. However, I do like how they handled the transition from Power's imagination of death to her eventual rescue by Denji. The ambient noise of the city really elevates Denji's and her reaction afterwards, helping to make the subtle attack from the subsequent Leech Devil all the more surprising and impactful. Furthermore, the animation and direction for the sequence feels league stronger than the former. The way the smoke effects cloud our screen, the way the blood sloshes up beneath Denji's feet as he scrambles and rushes his opponent, almost falling over with his eagerness to do so. It's a wonderfully kinetic scene that's amplified even further by Denju's voice as he delivers the monologue for the final attack. Having only seen this series once and read it only once, this fight scene due to the treatment it's received in this series has been offered a chance to stand as one of the best fight scenes in this story, making it all the more memorable. It's spectacular with the cutoff by Hayakawa's Fox Devil made all the more emphatic as a result. And even if we put the action aside, I love the attention the series gives to the finer details, like Hayakawa turning off his alarm in a controlled manner, how he slowly opens his balcony door pictured from afar and makes his coffee in the morning. All of these choices help not only to create a distinct atmosphere, but to tell us something about Hayakawa himself without interfering with the script of the original series. He's a creature of habit, order, and duty, building up the perfect party for power to crash and terrorize with her presence. I will say, however, while humorous, this direction does feel different to the manga in tone, and I think that's been discussed online quite a bit. Where the manga felt a lot more silly and impulsive, this feels a lot more measured and muted. In tone, I mean. Whether intentional or not, I thought it worth mentioning at this moment before I dive into what is many and my personal favorite part of this first season. A sequence I am going to be calling henceforth, A Tale of Two Gropes. Or at least I would call it this if it for some bizarre reason wasn't split in two. To some, this might be a non-issue, but for me, this split up the two best contrasting scenes in the manga. Denji's encounter with power and subsequent encounter with Makima, it makes for a good cliffhanger to end an episode on, but in my opinion, splits the two scenes that work together the best in the series. As I mentioned towards the beginning of this review, Denji comes from a life of virtually nothing. And as if like a stray dog picked up by Makima's animal control, he quickly tries to find a goal to latch onto, a dream to help him feel like part of the group, like part of the team, to feel like his life is worthwhile for his little dog's sacrifice. And while this initial motivation is played for laughs on a number of occasions, that by the way worked to great effect surprisingly, it's Denji's reaction to his reaching of this goal that's quite interesting. In the anime, 
I like how the direction emphasizes how the magic and wonder of the experience evaporates away following the first grope on power. Something isn't right and the direction of the scene visually reflects this. The angle is flat and lifeless. The sound design is uninspired and empty. The expression on Denji's face says it all. This isn't what he expected. And the reason I would have liked for these scenes to have followed each other would be to emphasize their intentional contrast. When we switch scenes to Makima's meeting with Denji at the top of the following episode, the muted direction from Power's scene is flipped on its head once Makima turns up the heat. The fuzzy, shaky camera point of view with soft edged lighting, it's a wonderful touch to add a sense of intimacy to the occasion. Suddenly, we can observe the dust floating in the air like this moment in time is significant and we need to breathe it all in. The music itself serves to enhance the illusion of what's going on also. If you're wearing headphones, the notes float from one ear to the other independent of each other in a certain rhythm. Almost like we are in this moment with Denji and our senses have been dulled or compromised. It feels almost dreamlike again. However, this time in a way that we've not yet seen so intense. Amplified by the outstanding voice work from Makima's voice actor, her matter-of-fact way of speaking slowly and seductively crawls to a whisper until the music and her voice stops and gives way to the grope depicted during a short dolly zoom to further give weight to that moment itself. We exist in this moment for a brief interlude with the only audio noticeable coming from Denji's hand on her fabric, almost like nothing else in the world exists in this moment. It's a great scene that plays to the strengths of the medium, and as we eventually leave this moment and retreat back to normality, the audio from the clock and eventually the ambient noise of the office returns to the scene. In addition to that, a nice visual metaphor that wasn't apparent in the manga between Power and Makima scenes was the use of real and artificial light to emphasize the difference between the two experiences. Power's offering was held under harsh artificial bathroom light to perhaps emphasize how cold and artificial this encounter was, while Makima's was lit with the warm hues of the setting sun. And most importantly, there's a change in physical level that reflects that emotional reality. Where Denji stood above power during their scene, in Makima's, it's the exact opposite. She looms over his shoulder, standing next to him at first while he sits, and when he falls to the floor, this divide in how they perceive each other is embellished and emphasized. Makima is powerful and in control, treating Denji like a dog she's training, and just like with any new puppy, you reward good behavior with treats. That way, they understand who the master truly is. In response to this interaction with power, it was honest and platonic. Through their combined journey in this arc, they form a much more tangible and mutually beneficial relationship. With Makima's, she further manipulates Denji into accepting a tremendously dangerous mission to find and apprehend a villain that's eluded her and her agency for years. The Gun Devil. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our main narrative through line, the Eternity Devil. Before I talk about the story itself, I want to talk firstly about something I read in preparation for this review. A one-shot manga entitled Look Back, released in 2021 by Tatsuki Fujimoto himself. And within this, it drew my attention to something Fujimoto does tremendously well. Something I noticed in that one shot and in this very arc numerous times. That being a shocking and sudden twist of events. Sometimes in storytelling, there's an indication that something big will happen soon. Where the author alludes to something approaching on the horizon subtly or explicitly. In any case, this can be compared to Hitchcock's famous bomb under the table narrative technique, where one to varying degrees lets the readers know there's a metaphor bomb under the table, turning a given scene into a great mechanism for building tension. However, as it happens, Fujimoto forgoes such warnings in favor of something that will completely take you by surprise. In this arc, Fujimoto begins to show us a flashback of a family. It's filled with enough detail and its very own narrative to allow it to stand on its own two feet. We follow the story, eagerly awaiting a resolution that's being built up to, and then... <laughs> we're reminded that this was a story detailing the gun devil's origin. Impressing unto us in a much more visceral fashion just how sudden and devastating this disaster was. And I think what I love about this technique is that it's so versatile. Fujimoto uses this very technique in Look Back to create a powerful sense of loss and emotional outburst. Right here in this arc, he uses it to impress upon us the severity of the occasion. However, right now we have one goal. Find the gun devil. And they have a means to do so too. 
Following the attacks that took place wiping out millions of people across the world on behalf of the Gun Devil, certain parts of the Gun Devil have been found in different bodies of different devils. And once enough parts are gathered, they start to be drawn to the Gun Devil itself. Simple, effective, and within that framework, there's tons of flexibility. So, how does Fujimoto proceed? By setting up a narrative technique I adore in long-running TV shows and movies, the bottle episode. In these situations, the director, or in this case, author, takes the established cast and places them into a finite space for the majority or the entire duration of the story. I love this because we no longer need context clues or establishing shots. Instead, we can focus on continuous scenes filled with opportunities for interesting character retrospectives and, in the case of Chainsaw Man, gags. This was the section I was most interested in to see how they'd adapt it. Within a manga, the familiar and box setting of a series of rooms and doors can be striking and lend well to the medium at hand. There's a tremendous amount of perspective on offer there. But in animation, you need to oftentimes use different techniques specific to the medium to not look super boring. Furthermore, with his approach, Fujimoto leaned heavily on the strengths of the manga medium itself to help communicate his jokes. I mean, some of these gags or sequences look as though they're straight out of a comic strip in some instances. This is, of course, to the strength of the manga. As someone that studies film and art for a living, the concept of a bottle episode has always fascinated me with how, when done well, they can be massively engaging, offering up tons of tension as a result. And while I don't think this adaptation did anything incorrect or super wrong, I do think the anime struggled to compensate for that loss of strength otherwise seen in the manga. In animation, as I've pointed out numerous times in this review, color is a massive strength it has. However, this entire episode is based in these flat yellow tones. These can of course be evocative of different films or horror stories in the genre, but with all the time we spend here, it only ends up feeling more and more one note than the comparatively colorless manga somehow to me. This isn't of course to suggest that this didn't offer anything noteworthy or great to enjoy. Following the trail of the gun devil, Denji, Aki, Power, and three new characters, Himeno, Kobenai, and Arai, following the slaughter of a single weird looking devil in the building, find themselves trapped on the eighth floor. They can't go up or down the stairs, they can't go through the ceilings, and the windows all lead back to the 8th floor. It's like they're stuck in their own little parallel universe or wormhole dimension. I love this. This is the third arc of this series, and while each arc ends with a big battle between Chainsaw Man, Denji, and Insert Monster here, each encounter feels so very different from each other. The first one in the introductory arc facilitates our introduction to the world and its rules. The second one with the Bat Devil served to introduce us to different characters, and this one very much shows us how the Chainsaw Devil powers work in greater detail, all the while allowing us to form much more deeper connections to the likes of Aki, whose backstory we see Himeno, who provides the stakes for Denji in this arc with a kiss to motivate him, or Power, who provided me with more belly laughs than any other manga I've read in the past. Power's now famous plan to become Prime Minister never misses its mark for me. It's the right level of absurdist humor meeting dire circumstances that tickle me in a way only Power and, well, Cartman can muster. Denji falling asleep in the bed was a gag that I loved in the manga and thought translated over to the anime really well. The way the camera constantly switches between Hayakawa and Denji as he slowly drifts to sleep gets me every time and is very similar to the manga's portrayal of the events, funnily enough, with how it's framed. Something I did notice while this series was on the air was just how many folks ended up hating Kobeni and her frankly realistic reaction to the situation at hand. I think moments like this not only show how incredible her voice actor is at performing, but on a narrative level helps to create moments of courage that feel all the more powerful down the line as a result of this initial cowardice. Contrast is king, folks, and people are complicated and messy, so try to keep that in mind. All of that aside, however, something I thought this section of the anime did rather well was communicating the horror element of the series, perhaps better than any other episode so far. The sheer dread and drama that builds up to Aki being stabbed by Kobeni is feverish and a standout moment in the series now for me. And not to mention I thought it was more striking than it was in the manga, with Denji's descent into the bowels of the devil itself also receiving similar focus. And I think that's one of this adaptation's biggest strengths. It can on occasion fail to live up to some aspects of the manga, but in others it offers extra focus and care on less beloved moments such that they can then in turn become someone else's favorite moment. 
In other words, it's an entirely different and unique experience, and in my opinion, both are worthy of your time and attention. With that said, the bloody carnage in the manga is once again enhanced by the gruesome barbarism of this scene. There's so much thrashing, pulsating, and impressive movement on display, enhanced by the sound design and the shrieking cackles of Denji's voice actor. However, I'd be lying if I said that this was the part of the arc people remember or that I have stuck in my head. Please drink responsibly. Like the prior arc, the conflict wasn't the focus, but instead the rewards and resolutions. Following the demonstration, Himeno and the rest of the group go out for drinks together in celebration. Makima is supposed to attend to this get together and she does so, drinking a hell of a lot more than pretty much anyone else at the table. However, something happens. Himeno is drunk, she promised Denji a tongue kiss, and what Denji gets is not that. Instead, Fujimoto decides to draw one of the most legendary panels I've ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, behold. Art is meant to make you feel something, and that something can be anger, joy, lust, or really anything. And this piece, this piece right here that you're looking at, that I'm making you look at for longer than you might be comfortable with, this made me feel something deep in my stomach. I only wish I could say the same for the anime. Instead of the nostalgic nausea I'd normally feel wash over me with this scene, the anime's interpretation only left me with disappointment. And while, well, disappointing for now, there is a silver lining that we can all hang on to as a collective fan of high art. The issue at hand here is that unlike manga, which depicts every disgusting element of the vomit in minute detail, the anime, for reasons I can only assume are censorship, decided to pixelate the entire fantastic event taking place in Denji's mouth here. Does this suck the joy out of the scene? Absolutely. But do we have the digital release of this series to look forward to that I suspect won't have the tasteless censorship for us to endure? The answer is yes. Following this event, Himino takes Denji back to her place where he wakes up. I plan to talk about this episode in detail later in the video when discussing the development and behind the scenes aspects of the season, but I have to gush for a second because episode 8 is on another level when it comes to this season's quality. And that's not to suggest that this season's quality is necessarily low, the effort and ambition across the board is evident for all to see, but this episode, and really this scene itself, is astonishing. So intimately depicted as Himino moves around her apartment to get ready. If there's any scene that was enhanced by the anime's adaptation, it's this one. It's breathtakingly impressive. A masterclass in character acting and both some truly inspired animation choices. One that stood out to me is the POV shaky cam as Himino approaches Denji on the bed. It's his point of view we're seeing and you can really feel that. It offers a remarkably unique look while increasing the level of intimacy of this otherwise casual encounter. There's just so much movement and creativity, and narratively, this all serves the purpose of showing us where Denji's mind is at. Is he looking to hold out for Makima? Does he feel guilty? Well, will it matter? By the time I finished reading this arc, I felt myself thinking, this, more so than any other story I've read, feels like a brilliant and natural evolution of the tropes established by One Piece and, before then, Dragon Ball. This feels like something entirely fresh and new, and I don't really understand how best else to express that feeling. This is of course not to say that this story is remotely like any of these properties, however the strengths that make these stories stand out for me, I feel were inspirations for Chainsaw Man. Tatsuki Fujimoto is the youngest mangaka I've ever covered on this channel and, in addition to that, the only creator I've ever covered that's younger than me. At 30 years of age, he comes from the generation of children that grew up with stories like One Piece and Naruto and he says as much. The choice to have this seismic shift in narrative occur at this time, following this intimate event in this way, it just feels exceedingly refreshing. And when I was reading the manga for the first time, I audibly gasped when I saw this reveal. It's remarkable what this young author is able to pull off at this stage of his career and just makes me very excited to see what more he can come up with and who he can inspire in the future. The Katana Devil Alright, so now we arrive at the last arc of this season, and fittingly, it's the longest. Stretched across the runtime of about four and a half episodes, and with the conclusion of the last arc being Makima meeting an intimate end courtesy of a gun. Oh wait. Well then. 
With this narrative decision, Fujimoto is keeping us off balance. He's got on the record and pointed out that he likes being able to write stories that keep you on your toes, stories that keep you off balance and unsure as to what exactly is around the next corner. He has Makima shot, Denji conflicted and guilty, but determined to be with her in another scene. And so with that, we as an audience are thinking about how the bad news of Makima's demise will impact Denji and his motivation. And then something even more substantial happens. We've gotten hints about this particular angle towards the end of the last arc, but every villain or devil that Denji and the corporation he fights for faces off against seems to have the same underlying mission driving them in the direction of Denji to steal his heart. And right as Makima was taken out by those Yakuza thugs, Denji gets shot in the face by another member of this unit in the middle of a restaurant with Aki, Power, and Himeno present. Something I've noticed that this series does is that when one episode ends, the next episode and the team that created that episode will represent the closing moments from the previous episode in their own way. It adds a different atmosphere, oftentimes showing a different point of view and helps to transition us in a natural way from one scene to another contrasting moment. The beginning of episode 9 offers such a scene, where episode 8 closed in a harrowing, emotional and beautiful fashion. Episode 9 offers a much more gradual transition to Denji's interjection to the battle as Chainsaw Man. It's surprisingly effective and I haven't seen any anime that I've covered employ such approaches. Everything about this scene feels desperate and out of nowhere. Himino is down for the count. Power is hamstrung trying to help her stay alive by managing her blood supply. Denji is out cold from being shot in the face and Aki is struggling to stay alive against this new enemy. It's a frantic and desperate scramble to regain the upper hand with Aki actually getting just that in the end. But thanks to this new character, that victory and advantage he struggled to achieve is robbed from him. And when I was first digesting this material, my heart was racing. I mean, sincerely. You feel that in the desperation of everyone involved on the side of Denji, particularly through the likes of Aki whipping out his sword without regard for the very consequences we learned of in the prior arc. And most impactfully, Himeno. This is once again a story of contrast. In the same way the designs betray and work to complement the actions and personalities of these characters, Himeno's selfless sacrifice of herself to prolong the life of the person she loves in Aki is contrasted starkly by the devil she enlists the help of. This beautifully altruistic action is set alongside the utterly terrifying and grotesque looking ghost of hers once she gives her body up for it. Truly the stuff of nightmares. Last time, I said that this girl was scary. Now I am saying that this girl terrifies me to my core. Systematically and in retaliation to the Yakuza that attacked her and her agency, she sacrifices person after person atop this weird monastery or shrine area, and in doing so, turns a ton of Yakuza targets into popped blood balloons remotely from God knows how far away. This feels like the most otherworldly godlike power we've seen in this series, and Makima's control and crushing of her enemies from afar was fittingly abrupt and cool, although not particularly flashy, and I thought that was a bit weird. It felt as though what we saw in the trailer was, I don't know, a lot more interesting and dynamic. That said, the music and audio for this section is quite compelling for the moment that it's in, leveraging that aspect of the production to help elevate the source material, and it works well enough. And unfortunately, in the same vein, I didn't think that the fight with Katana Man was as impressive as I was hoping for either. The moment where he cuts Denji in half felt as though it didn't hit the dramatic highs of the manga that moment offered. Perhaps my expectations were misplaced, or maybe I didn't vibe with the director in this instance. Either way, it's a little upsetting. The conflict on the ground with Denji and what's left of his team is brought to a swift resolution as this weird kid and Katana Man make their strategic retreat. I'll only touch on this for a moment, but I have to say something here because apparently I'm a massive simp for Fujimoto's layouts. Look at how stupidly easy it is to read this layout. Look how naturally our eyes follow this page with Kobeni on the 6th and 7th pages of chapter 28. Look at how each panel guides your eyes to the next one in the sequence effortlessly, creating this sense of movement without movement at all. This is the stuff I live for. And whoever adapted this moment seems to agree. As this attack to save Chainsaw Man from Kobani received the most attention and flash in this episode, I think. It looks terrific. And that's where this commentary on the adaptation would normally end, but 
Unlike the manga, after this episode's conclusion, I couldn't help but feel that the last scene outshone every other in the episode to a substantial degree. And given that Makima's control scene was not only pivotal to the episode as a whole, but honestly might be the most important reveal in the entire season, and it just didn't feel like it was given the attention I thought it deserved, I mean, it's the mask off moment for the character, and at least compared to what was promised in the trailers, the anime's adaptation feels extremely safe and almost boring compared to what was promised. This isn't, of course, to suggest the scene is bad. This is Chainsaw Man, after all. No amount of uninspired framing could suck the joy out of it completely. I mean, the writing and setup alone is going to allow folks to love this moment for what it is and find it shocking. But the way it's framed, while perfectly fine and adequate, I felt could have used a little more flair. With that said, Kobeni's scene offered her a nice little bit of redemption after her championing Denji's death mere episodes ago. I just would have preferred if that attention went a little more elsewhere but I suppose it's a nitpick. Speaking on Aki Hayakawa for just a moment, within both this arc and the next one, he acts as the heartbeat or emotion of the story. Speaking on this arc specifically, particularly following the initial fight with Katana Man, despite almost losing his life, he focuses instead on what he's lost, which quite elegantly highlights what makes his character a wonderful contrast with the likes of Denji again, causing Denji himself to feel that discrepancy between him and Aki also. However, in reality, Denji too has something Aki should want that is, to live. Denji is happy with his lot in life, and numerous times he alludes to this reality in the story. It's a wonderful, powerful feeling for a character to have. He's happy that he's alive every single day, whereas a large part of Aki's story concerns him being tortured by his decisions as he tirelessly marches like a soldier day in, day out towards his death. In other words, Denji seems to be willing to do anything to maintain the best life he can possible, whereas Aki seems to be tirelessly in search of his way out. In of his own goal. Within this arc, there's a great emphasis on flashbacks exploring the first meeting and budding friendships with Himino. That said, all of this has been quite emotionally heavy and action-packed, so next up is probably my favorite part of this particular arc. The training mini-arc. Now that it's become known that the Gun Devil is after Denji's heart for some yet unknown reasons, Makima has seen it necessary to enroll both Power and Denji himself into training to hone their respective abilities and powers. It also acts as a nice tune-up for everyone reading along to see what makes each of these characters tick physically and somewhat emotionally. Prior to accepting them as pupils or playthings as he calls them later on, this rather intimidating individual asks Power and Denji a set of questions probing their individual morality. The initial fight itself between Kishibe and the combined efforts of Denji and Power is supremely ambitious and well executed, although quite short. The storyboard swoops across the area and has so much fun doing so before being brought to an abrupt end as swiftly as it began. The animation is spectacular and in my opinion, again hides that very instance from the manga which it's based. Narratively however, this is an interesting scene too for upon a moment's notice, the teamwork between the two is apparent. And while power marching forward without hesitation can be chalked up to her fiend status and really her character in general, Denji's zero hesitation seems somewhat chilling to me. Which again makes me think back to the metaphor that's constantly being thrown around to describe what Denji is to both Makima and her agency. That he's akin to a dog. Dogs at least to me, aren't born killers, but they can be trained to be. And Denji seems to have lived a life that has sculpted him into this person, or Makiba is slowly turning him into someone that cannot value human life like Aki can. Who is, by the way, someone we have now learned has lost the power to wield his fox spirit in battle due to how reckless he was being in the battle with Katana Man, signifying perhaps that even a literal canine spirit couldn't comfortably do what the devil agency expects Aki to do. This is an agency that sees their employees as necessary and probable collateral damage. Aki specifically demonstrates this with their offer to allow him to wield a new devil, a devil that can see into the future. One that says he, Aki, is going to die in the worst possible way. And due to this, we'll give him some of his power in exchange for a front row seat to his own death. How screwed up is that? All that depressing stuff aside, the training with power in Denji is super fun. Dozens and dozens of failed attacks on this special division leader later, and the team of Denji and Power are after trying everything that came to them naturally. And in a cute bit of character collaboration, they jointly come up with a plan to instead, and I quote, 
fight him using our minds. With Denji's response to this idea being, like, how cool would it be if we could fight like one of those brainy guys in manga and stuff? This, my friends, is the caliber of strategic introspection we're seeing now, so naturally I wasn't expecting much, but the plan that they do eventually come up with was actually kinda brilliant. Overall, despite this operation ending in a big fat loss, this dude gives them props for their efforts, this effort being their best to date. However, it does end with this scary dude lulling them into a false sense of security before teaching them yet again another lesson. Which again, I could choose to read as another indirect suggestion to Denji that he shouldn't trust Makima. The training continues until eventually Denji shows his gratitude to him. And interestingly, this is the last lesson that this individual teaches Denji, who once he shows his teacher gratitude, entices him to never accept him as a pupil ever again. He only trained Denji because he thought he was inhuman, but in this moment, it now doesn't seem to be the case. And he reveals this decision to step away from Denji and Power's training in an honestly unsettling scene between himself and Makima. The subject matter within this scene is that of him questioning Makima's allegiance to the agency, with some wonderful imagery depicting how untrusting and distant she feels to him, ending on an uncomfortable close-up of Makima's face. Makima herself has demonstrated a fascination with power, and she's demonstrated that she herself is capable of some truly horrific acts. This dude asks Makima in this scene if she is on humanity's side, and perhaps and this could be a stretch, but perhaps he's asking her this because she herself isn't human. And the only reason I wonder this is because this individual, this person that was training Denji, stopped training Denji when he felt that humanity emerge from him. He couldn't treat another human like the way that he's been treating Denji. And perhaps in this instance, he's finding it difficult to trust Makima because she herself isn't a human, or at the very least, isn't showing human tendencies. Perhaps Makima herself has her own ulterior motives concerning influence and subjugation. In the same way she wants to manipulate Denji like a dog, it seems like, particularly in the scene after this where she talks directly with the Yakuza themselves, she tells us as readers more about herself and her value system. She says, and I quote, Your necessary evil is just an excuse to justify your own crimes. Those excuses are unnecessary to society. Which tells me that she's doing everything because she believes it's the best for society. That's a real totalitarian way of looking at the situation when you ignore the context of the scene somewhat and extrapolate it out into a personal belief of hers. It made me wonder what she might actually be capable of as she hands over a bag filled with the eyes of the Yakuza's family members. Perhaps innocent family members. It makes me wonder how many eyes she has on the rest of the world. Pun definitely intended. Or maybe Fujimoto is totally screwing with me and this is exactly what he wants me to think. I don't know. But I digress. Everything that's taken place in this arc from the initial onslaught by the Yakuza and Katana Man to the counterattack by Makima to Denji and Power engaging in training to Makima pushing the Yakuza into a corner all culminates in one final battle between this sect of the Yakuza versus this new special division in the Devil Hunter Agency. One that begins as the new division infiltrates this building. During this section, we as an audience are introduced to a host of new characters, including the likes of the Violence Fiend, the Spider Devil, which looks horrifying and I'm not even scared of spiders, the Shark Fiend, who, let me tell you, gets very good in the next arc, and finally, the Angel Devil. A mysterious and unique devil that isn't hostile towards humans, one that if you come into contact with them, will shorten your lifespan. Aki takes the charge with this particular group's infiltrating of the thick zombie Bocade. There are, of course, the instances where Aki demonstrates his lack of consideration towards his own well-being, with him coming concerningly close to the angel devil. However, that's not the aspect of this encounter I find interesting. It's instead the description that this is a unique type of devil that isn't hostile towards humans. Aki versus Ghost Devil. The first interesting ruffle to show itself upon the initial insurgents operations comes by way of Hayakawa's both literal and metaphorical confrontation with a ghost from the past. The very ghost devil that Himeno wielded for the benefit of him is now the one he needs to overcome and take down. And it's here I find myself needing to remind myself of why Hayakawa is important to the story. To ground it. While the story of Chainsaw Man itself, through the likes of Denji, Power, and Makima, paint a rather nonchalant, inhuman, or silly story, Aki is also there to represent what's at stake. The love humans share for each other. 
the humanity of this world. With the very message Himeno leaves behind for him to read, cutting not only to the core of his story, but further reinforcing what this line of work and perhaps world is forcing him to be. A fearless killing machine, with his zero fear approach literally granting him the ability to slay this devil standing in his way. This is all to say that Aki is perhaps one of the best handled characters I've seen in this story, and one I have adored to follow throughout so far. Denji vs. Katana Man As power <laughs> goes off to do her thing, Denji vs. Katana Man round 2 gets underway, but honestly, despite this being the final big fight of the season, I honestly have mixed feelings on how it's portrayed. And on one hand, I can see a lot of movement, and I did very much enjoy the scene in the train, but on the other hand, outside of the train scene, which felt like an adequate adaptation to the manga source material, the fight itself felt to me like it was, I don't know, lacking identity, lacking intensity, and maybe even personality? And for a series like Chainsaw Man that oozes style and personality, for this specific criticism to be laid at the feet of this franchise on what should be its climactic episode is, I don't know, a little telling, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit more with behind the scenes stuff later. But to cut a long story short, it sort of felt in many ways like it was any other fight scene from the series lacking in any meaningful or interesting art direction to help it stand out. But that's not to say that nothing of note or interest occurs within. There's plenty, and in my mind, less could be more with this fight. Specifically when we've already sort of seen some of this already, with this being the first rematch of the series so to speak for Denji to deal with. It should go without saying that the panel layouts work supremely effectively, in not only conveying the action moment to moment, but also the narrative when it rears its head across the bout. Quote, a beast should never trust a hunter is such an instance of this occurring. This particular phrase that Denji recalls from his training arc acts for the impetus behind his decisive winning blow. Luring Katana Man into a false sense of security, seizing his chance to use his chainsaw powers in a way that we've not yet seen, with the way the anime composes its shots, much like the panels from the manga section help to effectively conceal the surprise for us to discover on our own. There's plenty of introspective and human moments from Katana Man towards the start of this battle, however by the end, he's used in a way that I didn't see coming. Following their respective fights, Denji and Hayakawa reconvene by the train tracks. In a surprisingly sweet moment of connection, they both get to share in a moment of admittedly immature but much needed humanity and therapy, if you can even call it that. Taking turns to kick Katana Man in the nuts for what he's done to them both over the course of this arc, Fujimoto also makes a subtle nod to the Requiem scene in Hunter x Hunter, only instead of a murder orchestra, we have a Requiem composed with the screams brought on by nutshots. Truly, it's a work of art. And that just about brings us to the conclusion of this season, and while I've largely had praise for this adaptation, the behind the scenes demonstrates a very different story. One that requires a lot of nuance to tell and an ability to separate the final product from the reality of the situation at hand during its development. And when I finish telling you all the information I can about it, my hope is that by the end, you can come away with a different outlook on this season of Chainsaw Man. Because right now, I want to emphasize just how much of a miracle the quality of this series truly was, and how much potential was lost as a result. So, let's talk some behind the scenes. The first teaser of the Chainsaw Man anime was a fascinating thing to take in as it happened to be released right off the back of me finishing my very first read through of the manga. Fujimoto is a weird mangaka in the best kind of way and that disorientating chaos is one of the most defining and appealing aspects of his work. And so for this teaser's direction to be so calm, grounded and, well, moody was fascinating and I was interested to learn about how this came to be. Studio Mappa is a divisive name, whether it be because of personal feelings on their anime or simply their long-standing history of terrible working conditions. And so, with a huge name like Chainsaw Man attached to them, it was quite the surprise to learn that they forewent any meddling production committee to fund this themselves with full creative control, allowing them to set their own pre-production schedule to at least attempt to facilitate one man's ambitious ideas for this project. And that man was... Ryo Nakayama. At only 32 years old, it's a remarkably young age to helm an entire series, let alone one as renowned as this. It came about thanks to MAPPA producer Keisuke Sashimo, who approached him during Nakayama's directorial efforts in Jujutsu Kaisen's 19th episode. Nakayama's a talented animator in his own right, and with Sashimo being a huge animation geek, he was aware of his talent for robust animation both in terms of action and character, along with a number of interesting ventures in the director's seat. Alongside this, Nakayama has a lot of talented friends, 
friends. An invaluable asset for a series director to have, by the way. And one that was absolutely taken advantage of many times throughout this production. However, the core belief that Nakayama has echoed throughout countless interviews at this point is that this anime must not feel like an anime. And as a huge fan of Fujimoto, Nakayama strongly believes that his work is completely inseparable from the movies that inspired them. And so, this adaptation must feel like live-action cinema. From the absence of any stylized colors, to banning anime expressions like exaggerated sweat drops and intentionally hiring newer actors to avoid traditional performances, Nakayama has done everything in his power to make this feel like animated live-action and seldom anything else. This has been quite the divisive approach, and it's easy to see why. Fujimoto's work, while certainly inspired by cinema, particularly in its drama, often sees its action and comedy sway back and forth between moments of wild expressionism and larger-than-life spreads, with covers that display a lot of vibrant and stylish color work. None of this is found in Nakayama's Chainsaw Man by design, instead translating these into set pieces that wouldn't be out of place in Western cinema. As a result, the anime hasn't been hugely popular among Japanese fans, with a widespread petition being formed encouraging MAPPA to remake it with another director. Nakayama and many other staff have unfortunately been faced with exceptional vitriol on social media and when one of the chief animation supervisors offhandedly tweeted that safe adaptations are boring, it caused enough of a storm that as punishment, the studio stripped his credit down from chief to regular supervisor for his debut episode. If there's one thing I hope is clear throughout this video, however, it's that I really do enjoy this adaptation, but it does have its issues, and I think there's legitimate criticism worth listening to. This grounded cinematic approach does wonders for shows in some areas, while coming at the cost of successes in others. But if one thing rings true, it's that when Nakayama's vision is put into the hands of strong individual directors, real magic happens. Episode 4 is far and away the most exhilarating action-oriented episode in the series, and it comes from Tatsuya Yoshihara, someone many of you will know as the passionate series director of Black Clover. And while that series was famously marred by a horrific production environment, Yoshihara's passion and talent for incredible action always shone through. His relationship with Nakayama was forged there and resulted in his presence on the Chainsaw Man adaptation as the series action director. In spite of this role, and frankly, he admitted to not contributing much anyway, the moment he steps into the director's chair, he does away with Nakayama's rules of grounded action and expression, and instead shows Denji at his most wild, both in his reactions and the way he slings himself around the screen in a larger-than-life and unrestrained manner. And yet, he still brings it back to earth when needed, and delivers wonderful comedy chops in its second half, in a way that nails Fujimoto's impeccable comedic paneling. Likewise, episode 8, as I mentioned earlier in the review, is an absolute masterpiece from Shota Goshozono, who elevates the series' core foundations. Its first half alone is a masterclass in realistic character animation with a board that oftentimes feels distant and bordering on voyeuristic, conveying the depth of the environment while letting its characters interact with it in a way seldom found in anime. At the same time, there are an abundance of ambitious POV shots that, although not executed perfectly, offer a unique and dynamic approach to navigating its setting. With a near total absence of music for its entire first half, it relies solely on diegetic sound and character performances to weave itself into such a delicate piece of animation, and it all comes together so damn well. Despite feeling like a footnote in an already phenomenal episode, its action in its second half is weighty and impactful, and carries all the necessary drama for what is one of the most pivotal moments of the season. On the flip side, there are also episodes that didn't quite land. And concerningly, they came directly from Nakayama. Episode 7 almost feels like a different show with how straightforward its storyboard is and how poorly its pivotal comedic moments land. Episode 1 and 12's action lacks any real identity and doesn't land with the gravitas you would expect from a debut and finale. Often a series director's episodes are ones to look forward to, the ones that showcase the adaptation's vision at its finest, and yet they're arguably the weakest by quite some margin. It opens up a curious question as to whether Nakayama's comparatively lesser outings as an episode director are because of his workload or inexperience, and if that inexperience and overambition as a series director is what led to a schedule that ultimately began to crumble. It's a tough one to tackle and something I think requires a lot of nuance and an ability to separate the final product from the reality of the production. While the series had an impressive pre-production phase, the ambitious nature of the series led to that privilege very quickly vanishing. 
pushing for non-stop movie level movement across a TV series is a big ask. And as the episodes began to air, the pressure began to mount and time very quickly slipped away from the production. What began with a modest staff list quickly ballooned, culminating in a finale that, to get the episode done, involved 24 animation supervisors, 42 second key animators, and worst of all, 23 external studios used for in-betweens on top of MAPPA's own internal team. To say that things imploded is an understatement. Getting those last few episodes done on time was a gargantuan effort that unfortunately put far too many people in the same overworked position MAPPA productions are widely known for. Some animators were forced to hand in rough stick figure layouts for second key animators to finish due to this punishing schedule. Static dialogue scenes that would have been drawn in any other scenario fell back on 3D models. It was extraordinarily tough, but I think the final results were clean enough to be largely unnoticed by fans. And it's honestly somewhat of a bittersweet tale to talk about. On one hand, I enjoyed the anime so, so much, and I think the final results are great and speak for themselves. But at the same time, it's the unseen that's concerning, and I'll be curious to see how things change going forward based on lessons learned during this production and based on the feedback it's received around the world. The opening from Shingo Yamashita, a wonderful director many will know from Naruto Shippuden and his recent adventures into Pokemon and Jujutsu Kaisen, is arguably the most perfect distillation of what Chainsaw Man is as a series. Many of its endings, such as the second one from Hitomi Kiriya, showcase a Chainsaw Man much in line with what my initial expectations were. Filled with fascinating colors and saturated lighting, they simply bring the quirky joy of the manga to life in a way the anime doesn't quite accomplish all the time. There are components scattered across the series that all lend themselves well to what this animated version of Chainsaw Man could be with further refinement and concessions made for this unwavering strife for realism, and I hope it's something that's absorbed by the key staff moving forward. While producer Sashimo has said many a time that he's around to stop the show from becoming too extreme and peculiar so as not to prevent mass appeal, I would argue that that flies in the face of what makes Chainsaw Man so special, and that going forward, it would be great to see further blending of these approaches. As noted, individual directors have already already done so to great success in the show already. So why not push that further and elevate what comes next in a way that services both the drama and the comedy and pays respect to just how profoundly weird Fujimoto is. I think when all is said and done, after the hype dies down and the controversies subside, Chainsaw Man Season 1 will be remembered as a fun, albeit restrained adaptation of what is one of the most experimental mainstream shonen series around today. While the efforts of certain supremely talented episode directors have elevated scenes to the level of magnificence from time to time, I still can't help but think about what could have been if this property was in the hands of a slightly more experimental series director. The work that was produced overall was very fun, but outside of certain directors choices with colour and lighting, I can't tell if I love this season in spite of the choices made or because of them. Perhaps we won't ever truly know the answer, but at the end of the day, it's the difference between a good adaptation and an excellent adaptation, so I guess I can't be too disappointed on that front. I mean, hundreds and maybe even thousands of different anime over the years would have killed to have this kind of focus and ambition behind it. And who knows? Maybe season 2 will take things in a much more bold and eccentric direction. But let me know what you guys think. That'll do it for this week. As always, I've been Totally Not Mark, and thank you all so much for watching.